upon us. Well, good morning, church, and if you would like to open in your copies of God's Word to 2 John, the second epistle of John. I chose to exegete this book for us this morning because uh, it's one of the only books in the Bible that's short enough that you can pretty much cover it in one go. Uh, In fact, 2 John, by word count, is the shortest book in the entire Bible. And um, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I always prefer walking through a book of the Bible as opposed to just preaching on whatever topic I want to. So, thus are we here this morning. There are two major points that I want us to… oh, there we go. Um, two main observations that I want us to be able to take home from this text this morning. Number one is that Jesus Christ is truly human. And number two is that Jesus Christ is truly sufficient. And as we begin to dig into this shortest book of the Bible, we we will begin to see why John apparently thought that this was so important to talk about. If you are medically able, would you please stand with me out of reverence for the public recitation of the inerrant word of the living God. Sorry, Mariana, your singing is still getting to me. Praise the Lord for music and what it tends to do to our emotions. The gospel, or no, not the gospel, the letter of John. The elder to the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, And not I only, but all those who have come to know the truth. Because of which, that truth that remains in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, his Son, in truth and in love. I rejoiced greatly when I discovered some of your children walking in truth, just as we received the commandment from the Father. And now I ask you, dear lady, not as though I were writing you a new command, but the one which we have received from the beginning, that we should love one another. And this is that love that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment which you have heard from the beginning, that you should walk in love. For many deceivers have gone out into the world those who do not confess Jesus Christ having come in the flesh. This is the deception and the antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have worked for, that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes beyond and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, that is the one who has the Father and the Son If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive them into your house and do not greet them, for the one who greets them shares in his evil work. I have much else to write to you, but I do not want to do it through paper and ink. Rather, I hope to come to you soon and speak to you face to face, that our joy may be complete. The children of your elect sister greet you. As far as the reading of the word of the Lord, you may be seated. There we go. Any mistakes that happen with the slide this morning, I assure you, are all on me. So, some important background information to understand about this short letter from John. First is, who is the author? Well, it is John the Apostle. How do we know that, considering the fact that he doesn't actually name himself in this letter? We know it primarily on the basis of how he writes. John has a very distinctive style. Uh, You don't have to be able to read Greek to be able to recognize it. If you read the Gospel of John and the three letters of John together, they all read very similarly to each other, but very different from the rest of the New Testament. Uh, Second John has that highly recognizable feeling, that vibe 
of having been written by John, that Paul and Luke and the other New Testament authors, they do not write like that. Now, interestingly, in both 2nd and 3rd John, the writer identifies himself as the elder. And that title has nothing to do with his age. Elder is actually one of several terms that the New Testament uses to refer to what we most commonly call a pastor today. John is identifying himself as the pastor. Which brings us to our next important bit of information, the question of when John wrote this letter. And the nearest that we can say is that it was probably sometime between 60 and 90 AD. We can't get a whole lot more specific than that because John himself doesn't say, I wrote this on such and such a date. We have to take some guesses. But the fact that he calls himself the pastor is a pretty good hint to us about the general time frame that we're looking at. Because early church fathers uh, record that after the Apostle John spent the first couple of decades of the Christian church going out and bringing the gospel to all the nations along with all of the other apostles, in his golden years, John settled down and was the pastor at the church in Ephesus, one of the most important cities of the ancient world. We have, for example, Irenaeus, there we go, uh, an, early, an important early church father writing about a hundred years after the close of the New Testament. He tells us this, the church in Ephesus was founded by Paul and had John remaining among them permanently until the times of the Roman emperor Trajan, who ruled, by the way, from 98 to 117 AD. So the best we can say if John lived, he, he died as an old man during the reign of Trajan, and he spent most of his older life as a pastor. The best we can say is that he's writing sometime late in the first century when he is uh, in his role as a pastor. So that raises the next question, who is John writing to? And the answer is an unspecified first century church. Again, we unfortunately can't be any more specific than that. John says in his opening verse, there we go, the elder to the elect lady and her children. Now, who is that? John is drawing on a frequent biblical metaphor that illustrates God's love for his covenant people. He personifies a church as a woman, as a bride. And we see this idea, God describing his covenant people as his bride numerous times in scripture. Perhaps the most infamous example being in the, the book of the prophet Hosea, when you have unfaithful Israel being compared to an adulterous um, prostitute of a wife. But there are also positive examples of God's people being called his bride. We have, for example, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, when the Apostle Paul says that I am jealous for you, the Corinthian church, with a godly jealousy because I have promised you in marriage to one husband to present a pure virgin to Christ. Likewise, in Revelation chapter 21, when we are given a grand vision of the new heavens and the new earth that await us, we're told that one of the seven angels came to John He'd been one of the seven who had held the bowls of the last plagues. And he said to John, come and I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. So John is taking this frequent biblical metaphor and he's building upon it when he writes to a Christian congregation and refers to them simply as the elect lady. Her children then, mentioned in verses one and four, are the individual believers in that congregation. There are likewise uh, several places in the Bible where individuals in a city or individuals in a religious group are referred to as the children of that religion. Probably the most famous example uh, comes from Galatians chapter 4, verses 25 and 27, where Paul is comparing the old and new covenants by comparing them to Abraham's two wives, Hagar and Sarah. He says, beginning in verse 25, now Hagar represents Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present Jerusalem, for she is in slavery with her children. 
but the Jerusalem above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Rejoice, childless woman, unable to give birth. Burst into song and shout, you who are not in labor. For the children of the desolate woman will be many, more numerous than those of the woman who had a husband. In other words, what Paul is saying is, the Jews who rejected Jesus as the Messiah are symbolized as Hagar. And Hagar and her children, in other words, the former covenant and those who still believe in it, are still enslaved to sin. They are still in bondage. By contrast, Sarah is a symbol of the Jerusalem from above, that church that we got a glimpse of in Revelation chapter 21. The Christian community, as God's covenant people, is the bride of Christ, and individual Christians are the children of that bride. This explains not only why John opens the letter the way he does, but also how he closes it in verse 13 when he says, the children of your elect sister send you greetings. In other words, Pastor John of First Baptist Church at Ephesus is writing a letter to another church nearby to warn them of some kind of danger in their midst. And while he's writing, the rest of the church at Ephesus sends their greetings as well. John says in verse 4, I was very glad to hear to find some of your children walking in truth. Some of the people in this church are indeed living in a God-pleasing and God-honoring way. But there are apparently false teachers in their midst attempting to lead people astray. And that brings us to our final um, element worth noting about the background of 2 John, the occasion, why is he writing this letter? It is a stopgap refutation of false teaching until he can arrive. He says in verse 12, though I have many things to write to you, I don't want to use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and see you face to face. Remember that at this point in his life, John is an old man, and he likely cannot travel very far very quickly. This is in the days before vehicles and, and modern medical assistance. He knows that a letter will be able to travel faster than him, so he intends to visit this church himself, but additionally, he's writing a letter that's going to go ahead of him and let the church know that he's coming and that he's going to bust some skulls. He is going to confront the troublemakers himself face to face when he arrives. This brings us back to our two main points for this morning. Let's find out who these false teachers are, why they are wrong, and why it matters for us today. Our first major point, Jesus Christ is truly human. The single biggest clue that we get concerning the identity of John's enemies is in verse 7 of 2 John. He says, many deceivers have gone into the world. They do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. Now, in the early centuries of Christianity, there were actually many such groups who denied the incarnation. They were willing to believe that Jesus was God, or maybe a God, but they were not willing to believe that Jesus was truly man, that it was possible for God to become man. Why would they believe such a thing, and why does it matter? These various groups, they, they weren't all identical, but they all fit under the loose umbrella term of Gnosticism. And the Gnostics simply defined, um, it, there's a whole full history to them that's quite complex, but in simplest terms, Gnosticism was an attempt to blend the Judeo-Christian worldview with Greco-Roman mysticism. Now, what exactly is that? One of the key ideas present in most forms of mysticism is the idea that the physical universe that, we, that we're living in is evil. And the way that this idea came about was re really through plain observation. People in the ancient world recognized that life is hard, especially without all of the conveniences of modern technology. 
most people lived on the knife's edge of starvation and had to work themselves to the bone every day just to produce barely enough food to survive. Disease was rampant, life was short, animals mercilessly tear each other limb from limb. To paraphrase the Apostle Paul, creation itself groaned. Now certain Greek philosophical schools of thought saw this basic idea that life is hard and they responded to it by proclaiming that the physical world is an irredeemable evil and our greatest goal in life should be to escape the physical realm, to get into the spiritual world where hopefully we can escape from all this pain and misery. They never explained how they knew that, by the way. But this basic two-sided worldview, this dichotomy, this dualism between the assumption that everything spiritual is good and everything physical is bad, this worldview doesn't know what to do with the God-man. They don't know what to do with Jesus Christ. As the apostles spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire, mystics everywhere heard the good news and they wanted to believe it. But their previous worldview commitments would not allow them to believe that a perfectly good, perfectly holy God could voluntarily enter into his own creation. Why would you want to do that? This physical world is evil and passing away, and our whole mission in life is to get away from it. Why in the world would you want to go into it? And so, as a result, they had to end up radically redefining all of the words in the Christian vocabulary. We'll get to that more in a moment. But they looked at uh, verses such, a, such as these ones, and they could not accept what Scripture has to say about these kinds of things. Genesis 1.31, God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. A Gnostic, by definition, cannot accept that. Likewise, they cannot believe that Jesus would enter into his own creation so as to redeem it from its fallen state. Colossians 1, verses 19 to 20, it pleased God to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Gnostics cannot accept that. And so although they claimed to believe the gospel, claimed to be Christians, claimed to be brothers in the Lord, part of the congregation, they ended up having to, in reality, radically redefine what Christianity even is. Just to give you an idea of how severe their scripture twisting is, here is a bird's eye view of what the Gnostic understanding of the gospel and of creation is. Now you don't have to memorize all this, there's not gonna be a quiz at the end. Unless you get 100%, you can't leave the, the church. It's, the, the, all the details of this are not important to memorize. I just want to give you a flyby understanding of what the Gnostics believed about the nature of creation. The closest thing that the Gnostics have to the concept of God the Father is this big cloud of divine matter that they call the fullness from which all other divine things come. But it's important to note that the fullness is personless. It doesn't have feelings, it doesn't have thoughts, it doesn't make plans, it just sort of floats there. And all other divine beings and things just leak out of it at some point. At some point in long ages past, there were about 30 aeons, or what we might call lower G, lowercase g gods, that just came out of the fullness for no particular reason. And the last and least of these gods, called wisdom, rebelled against her intended function and gave birth out of her head to an evil and monstrous being. Think Gollum from Lord of the Rings. It's a really ugly, nasty little thing. And it is this creature that is the creator god of the Old Testament, according to Gnostic thought. The creator himself is ugly and evil because what he created is ugly and evil. 
So when Jesus shows up on the scene, they think, not only is he a completely different God from the Old Testament God, because that's evil, we want nothing to do with that, but Jesus comes bringing an entirely different message of salvation. Jesus is no longer the perfect God-man. What appeared to be his humanity must have instead been either an illusion, he's a hologram out of Star Wars or something like that, or he was a spirit that was trapped inside of a fleshy meat suit in the same kind of way that we might have to wear an astronaut's suit to go out into outer space. They end up radically redefining the very nature of Jesus Christ. And the gospel no longer means that God the Son has entered into his own creation so as to die a substitutionary a death for the atonement of his people. Instead, salvation is now about Jesus bringing you secret knowledge that will allow your soul to escape from your fleshy prison, bypass that evil creator God, and be absorbed back into the fullness, this unthinking, unfeeling, personless cloud of divine matter. Can you see how completely different these two worldviews are? Although Gnosticism claimed to be a denomination of Christianity, the plain and simple fact is that they are completely different religions. There is a reason why when the New Testament authors do speak against Gnosticism, they speak against it in the strongest possible terms. The Apostle John in 2 John 7 even calls it the deceiver and antichrist. He has... <laughs> He does not have a high opinion of Gnosticism. But as if them denying the nature of Jesus Christ was not bad enough, we now come to our second point, and it gets even more complicated. Jesus Christ is truly sufficient. Jesus Christ is truly human, which the Gnostics deny, and Jesus Christ is truly sufficient, which the Gnostics likewise deny. Verse 9 <clears throat> Anyone who does not remain in Christ's teaching but goes beyond it does not have God. The one who remains in that teaching, this one has both the Father and the Son. So the Gnostics somehow connected their heresy regarding the nature of Jesus to a list of their own moral demands that goes beyond what God ever required of his people. In verses 4 through 6, we're told what it is that Christ teaches us, what he demands of us. I, John, was very glad to find some of your children walking in truth, in keeping with a command we have received from the Father. So now I ask you, dear lady, not as if I were writing you a new command, but one we have had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commands. This is what you have heard from the beginning, that you walk in love. And Jesus says something very similar in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 15, when he says, if you love me, you will keep my commands. And just a few verses later, in chapter 15, verse 12, he says, this is my command, love one another as I have loved you. The two great commands, love God and love fellow believers. Now that naturally raises the question, how do we define love? In a, a very practical, boots on the ground kind of way, what exactly does it look like in our daily lives to love God and love neighbor? That's beyond the scope of the sermon this morning. We don't have the time for that, but the main point to note for right now is that becoming a Christian doesn't suddenly give you license to do whatever your sinful little heart desires. Jesus' blood has paid the price for my sin, so now I'm just going to go off and, and live wantonly. Jesus actually has a standard that he expects his people to live by. Here we find the great balancing act between faith and works. Jesus doesn't say that you have to follow his commands and do good things in order to receive salvation. No. 
He says that you are expected to do them because you have already been given salvation. In the same way that a husband or a wife expects their spouse to live in a certain way that reflects their marriage vows, their love and commitment to one another, so too Jesus expects his people to live in a way that reflects their claim to love him. To put it another way, good works are the fruit of salvation, not the roots of it. This reality can only be true, though, if Jesus is indeed the perfect God-man. Only if he partook in our humanity can he be our representative, and only if he is perfect in the way that only God is perfect can he perfectly and sufficiently accept the punishment that was due for us. Hebrews 2, verses 17 and 18. Jesus had to be like his brothers and sisters in every way, so that he could become a merciful and faithful high priest in matters pertaining to God to make atonement for the sins of the people. For since he himself has suffered when tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. And likewise, chapter 9 of the same book, Jesus did not enter into the heavenly sanctuary to offer himself many times as the high priest enters the sanctuary yearly with the blood of another, Otherwise, he would have had to suffer many times since the foundation of the world. But now he has appeared one time at the end of the ages for the removal of sin by the sacrifice of himself. Since the Gnostics have twisted and redefined the Christian gospel beyond recognition, they cannot believe that Jesus has attained perfect righteousness for us. They cannot accept that good works are the fruit of a salvation that has already been given. Instead, <clears throat> instead, they redefine doing good as avoiding involvement in the world, avoiding physical pleasure of any kind in order to be better prepared to escape this fleshy prison into the realms above. In this respect, John's enemies are much like Paul's enemies in the book of Colossians. We read in Colossians chapter 2, beginning at verse 16. Don't let anyone judge you in regard to food or drink or in the matter of a festival, new moon, or Sabbath. These are a shadow of what was to come and the substance is Christ. Let no one condemn you by delighting in ascetic practices and the worship of angels, claiming access to a visionary realm. Such people are inflated by empty notions of their unspiritual mind. They don't hold on to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and held together by its ligaments and tendons, grows with the growth from Christ, or from God, rather. In a similar manner, the Apostle John denies that mystics are truly a part of the body of Christ. He says in 2 John, beginning at verse 10, if anyone comes to you and does not bring Christ's teaching, do not receive him into your home and do not greet him. For the one who greets him shares in his evil work. Ouch. Mystics are to be rejected as wolves attempting to infiltrate and destroy God's people. Now, as a quick aside before we conclude our time together, this notion, <clears throat> excuse me, this notion of not receiving wolves into your home, that does not mean that we do not associate with non-believers. If you happen to have an atheist neighbor, a Muslim coworker, or whatever, you are, of course, allowed to be friends with this person, be involved in their lives, uh, invite them over for dinner, all those sorts of things. You are supposed to have a life outside of the church so that you can be a light in the darkness. What John is getting at here, rather, it's not the idea that we as individuals cannot associate with non-believers. It's more along the lines of we collectively as a church cannot partner with false teachers who have a false gospel. So as a very practical example, if a Roman Catholic pro-life organization were to come to Redbridge and ask for financial support or manpower, we could not, in good conscience, partner with them. Rome possesses a false gospel, 
So although we can rejoice to a limited extent that they are seeking to end the genocide of children, we applaud that. Nevertheless, we cannot pretend as though they are our siblings in the Lord because they are not. We cannot welcome the wolf into our house as though they were a lamb. But now we come properly to our point of modern application. All of this historical background stuff, it's all well and good. Um, it, It can even make the shortest book of the Bible a little bit more interesting. But what does all of this have to do with us at the start of 2024? I want to suggest two primary considerations for you to take with you into the coming week. First, with regard to the notion of Jesus being fully human, beware those who minimize Jesus. Admittedly, the Gnostic movement today barely exists. They were huge back in the early centuries of Christianity. In fact, you go back and you read the authors that were alive at that time. Gnosticism was arguably the greatest threat to Christianity within the first three or four hundred years of its existence. But self-proclaimed Gnostics alive today number in the dozens worldwide, and they mostly only congregate in their little internet forums. They, They really aren't a movement to speak of today. But while Gnosticism proper is essentially dead in the water, some of their ideas have taken on new life and have snuck their way into the public consciousness. For more than a generation now, movies like The Da Vinci Code and atheist college professors like Bart Ehrman have been feeding the lie into the American culture, the American public, that there is no one Christianity. Millions of people today believe that Gnosticism and other early heresies were equally valid forms of Christianities, and that no one has the right to claim the status of absolute truth. The gospel of Jesus Christ is whatever you want it to be. And the true good news becomes lost in a sea of relativism. Likewise, consider the New Age movement. It's more dangerous than the bead necklaces and rock crystals would suggest. They have this concept called Christ consciousness, which has similarities to the ancient Gnostic idea of the fullness. Jesus Christ was not the one true God come to redeem undeserving sinners, they say. He was rather a good teacher who had achieved enlightenment into greater spiritual realities. And like all great religious leaders, Gandhi, Martin Luther King Jr., on and on down the list, they were all birds of a feather. And Jesus just had discovered this secret knowledge that he wanted to pass along to you about how great you are and about the wonderful realms that await us beyond this terrible mortal coil. The culture around us is willing to say anything about Jesus other than the truth. We must heed the Apostle John's warning to remain in what Christ himself has taught and to not go beyond it. Secondly, rest in Jesus' sufficiency. And by that, I mean specifically his sufficiency for us to have peace with God. Within the Christian community, there tend to be two primary ways that we forget this precious truth of Jesus' sufficiency. The first one is uh, that you can have legalists who want to place additional burdens on people's backs. How many of us, especially maybe those of us of a particular generation, we remember hearing phrases like, attending the school dance will inflame your lusts. Alcohol is the devil's spit or watching movies will desensitize you to violence. During the course of church history, there have always been those in the Christian community who have come a little too close to believing the Gnostic idea that the physical world and physical pleasure are all bad things to be avoided, rather than good gifts from the hand of God 
to be enjoyed. If this happens to describe any of us here this morning, the Apostle John has a message for us, and it is stop. Don't place additional burdens on God's people that Christ himself has not demanded. Secondly, though, we also tend to forget Christ's sufficiency in that we sometimes psychologically damage ourselves by focusing too much on our own sin and not enough on the cross. There's certainly room in the Christian life for self-examination, for looking inward and asking the question, am I truly living in a way that honors the Messiah? That's a good thing, and that should be part of your Christian life. No two ways about it. But we can take that too far, and we can engage in navel-gazing, and just be saying to ourselves all the time, oh, what a wretch that I am. I can't stop sinning. I've sinned too much, and now I've lost my salvation like I can lose my keys. When we reach that level of self-pity and self-deprecation, we are no longer resting in Christ's righteousness. We are wallowing in our own lack of righteousness. Let us always renew our gaze upon the cross and what the perfect God-man, Jesus Christ, accomplished there.